Okay, hi Fif, welcome. Thank you. And uh, yeah, humor is serious business, right? A <laughs> very, very serious business <laughs> indeed. Yes. And uh, a lot of study goes into it. A lot of practice goes into it. And uh, I, I, I think it's it's easy to make people cry, but it's difficult to make people laugh. I guess. <laughs> I think laughter and tears are the flip side. You know, I think, yeah, it depends what you do and how you can make people laugh. But I think laughter just comes out of sheer joy, you know? It does. It does. Yeah. Yes. I, what I was trying to actually get at is you could put on a very, um, you know, um, like, like, for example, in the movies, it's a tear joker is probably much easier to make than a, a full length comedy film. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> what, I, that's what I meant to say. I probably worded it wrong. <clears throat> You worded it perfectly, perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the clown just didn't quite get it, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, I think, the beauty of the clown, because sometimes the clown is a little bit dense, you know. Everyone else is a lot smarter than the clown, so it goes, ooh. <laughs> so you said it beautifully. I just had to, you know, clean out my ears or something. <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, well... I don't quite agree with what you said about the clown being a little dense because I think the clown is probably the sharpest in the act. Because, like for example, in a circus, uh, the clown should not only know how to do the trick but also know how to fall gracefully and carefully. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, and especially with the type of clowning we do, which is medical clowning. I right. think it's really important where you have the nose of the clown, right. but you have the wisdom that is a direct connection from, as we say, the divine or from the gods. Because yeah. when you have that direct connection, you know when you can play a little bit stupid um, mm -hmm. because then you put someone else on a higher, on a higher level. And especially when you're working in the hospital with patients, mm -hmm. they need to have that where they feel that they're in control and you know they can have a a remote control, for example, right. and they can pretend to push buttons and I'll, you know, go this, this way, way and this way and this way, way. I'll fall on the floor. But then at the same time, if I know that they, the doctors and the medical team would like to have some rehabilitation, then I, um, uh, I cajole them in a beautiful way right. on how to do something. So to support the, the treatment plan. So no, thank you. You're you're absolutely right. It's about being really, really smart, but yeah. being really dumb at the yeah. same time. Yeah, exactly. And you're going to be darn intuitive as well because you kind of have to be ahead of the curve, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of uh, a, a patient's needs. Yeah. It's not just the patient's needs, um, especially in the Indian culture, mm -hmm. it's the needs of the whole team. And when I say the whole team, I mean also the, um, the people that are with the patient, whether it's parents or grandparents or aunts or children, you know, it's the extended family. And it's also the healthcare team, the medical team. And how do you bring all of that together and mm -hmm. still honor the patient? I mean, I think that is absolutely critical in honoring the patient, but pulling yeah. everything together and integrating that beautifully. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that uh, honoring the patient because sometimes it can sometimes backfire. You think if you're not uh, uh, if you're not intuitive to the needs of the parent, uh, the, the the patient. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the dichotomy of the clown comes in. The duality, not dichotomy, but the duality of being the stupid one, but being mm. the very wise one, because, mm. you know, um, may I give you an example? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this was the first time that I was with a patient. He was 16 years old, and I knew from the medical team that they were going to break the bad news to him that oh. he had a specific type of, of cancer. And I was in the room, and we were joking around, we were clowning around, and then the medical team came in, and, you know, they had long faces and, you know, they're, you know, getting themselves up. And uh, I said, oh, and I was getting ready to go. Mm -hmm. 
And the, the young boy said, no, jump on, don't, don't, don't go, leave. I mean, uh, stay, stay. And I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And so I looked to the doctor and the doctor said, stay. And I felt a little awkward. And then the news was broken and I could see this kid just slump and slump and slump. And I could see all the questions in his mind. And of course, you know, after, you know, a few minutes, the doctor said, do you have any questions? And it was like, and I said, well, well, I have a question. Can I ask the question? And the doctor, you know, was like, relieved. And I said, well, if I have to go on that chemo stuff, does that mean my hair is going to fall out? And so I was able to take the questions that the young boy had and put them in that stupid thing. And, oh, what am I going to look like and all of this? So the doctor was able to address me and in the back was able to also have a conversation with the boy. And soon there was this comfort level where the young boy was able to ask those questions and the doctor was able to respond again through the clown, right? right? And after that, it became a beautiful thing when there was bad news, I was brought in. And when I was brought in, it was just a beautiful way of of being, of lightening up a really, really hard, hard situation. Wow. And then what happens, you know, is because I build a relationship with the patient, the patient may not want to say something to the doctor, mm. may not want to say something to their children, the mm. grandchildren or the parents, because the fear is not so much what's here as the patient, it's like, what will happen? They're worried more about their loved ones. That, that's mm. what I found anywhere. There's so much more worry. So they'll come and they'll whisper things or they'll tell me things. And then I can see how we can uh, craft that. Where I can say, is this something that I can go and speak to the social worker about or the psychiatrist or the psychologist? And they'll go, oh, or we'll work through it. And when we work through it, then it comes in in a very, very elegant, beautiful way where I'm still the, you know, the, the dumb one. But at the same time, there's this grace where I can go and I can say, you know, sir, uh, madam, this is what this patient is feeling. How can we work through that together? And it's, it's a really lovely coming together. Yeah. Oh, yes, I can see that. I can almost uh, see it before my eyes. Uh, so... Uh, let me understand this a little better. So, is, is do you do you uh, do you strategize uh, an act before you go in, or are you is it mainly intuitive? It's intuitive. Okay. For me, it has to be intuitive, and part of the training mm -hmm. that we go through. Mm -hmm. I'm a theater professional, but I've also worked in the medical faculty for about 29 years in in Canada. Um, and now I, I'm here in, in India in Oroville. Uh, but part of that training is, you know, it's like a concert pianist, you know? Okay. You have to learn to play the scales and you play and you play and you play until it gets into your body. Right. After it gets into your body, you can sit down, but you're not gonna play, you know, Mary had a little lamb for someone who's more sophisticated. Hmm. And you're not gonna play this concerto or perhaps you might, for a five-year-old, it has to be age appropriate, right? So yeah. when I go in, and not only is it is it age appropriate, every person has a different vibration. So as right. you walk in, I might come in and I might walk into a door or I might, you know, turn around and fall or I might, you know, peek in. And then after that, depending on their response, you breathe in and you it just comes. Do I juggle? Do I play my ukulele? Do I pull out a puppet? Do I just stand there and do I go, I love you. I totally love you. And then it just comes in that way. No? So, uh, I know you have a BFA. So is that, uh, was that specialized in uh, the, the, the clouding or is it something that you adapted to what you're doing now? That's a, that's a very beautiful question. Thank you. Uh, my BFA was a Bachelor in Fine Arts and Theatre. Yeah. And one of my professors at that time, um, clowning 
was not a profession at that point when I went through university, okay? Mm -hmm. But my aunt was a medical doctor. She, in fact, uh, studied at Stanley University in Chennai, which is a, a renowned medical college. This was, you know, she's passed away now and she would have been 81 or 82 now. Okay. Mm -hmm. But when I was growing up in Canada, when she would uh, go and see seniors, I would go and I would sit and go with her and she would make her rounds and I would sit in the lobby and I would sing, I would dance, I would joke, I would listen. I would really listen to their stories. And I was always very curious and I always wanted to know the stories. So I think that was part of the background and the foundation for that. Uh, my father was just an absolute joker, complete joker. And my mother was a teacher, no? Oh, okay. So when I went to university, um, I took theater, I took dance, I took directing, and I did uh, a number of things. But the actual formation of the clown ing came after words, and it was to practice. And when I was 18, I came to India to find myself, right? My parents are Indian. I was born in Tanzania. I grew up in Canada. And I, I really, really wanted to find my roots. It meant so much to me. And so I came here, and that's when I went uh, with the nuns from Stella Modest College uh, in Chennai. And I went into villages, and I began to play. I was just graduated from the 12th standard, grade 12. I began to play. I began to joke. I began to do these things. But I didn't know that that would eventually be the formation of what is now my practice as a therapeutic slash medical clown. So it's something that evolved. Wow. And if I may add, I think both my husband and I are very, very blessed in that way. He also has founded MediClown Academy with me and uh, is a performer, but we both come from medical families. So we understand that because you kind of grow up with it a bit. His father was head of ophthalmology and uh, at the U of A. And we also worked in the faculty of medicine, uh, you know, uh, developing cases and things like this. So it, it was a real coming together. Hmm. So it was something that evolved. Now we need to look at training. There's so many different things now that we really need to look at. Yeah. Hey, it looks like the stars all aligned to get you where you are. <laughs> I think the stars well, always... It's the kind of background that you've had as... Even as a child, you see, you, you yourself say that you were a fond of playing and, uh, you know, being, I can see a very happy child in you. I was a brat. I was a happy child, but I was a brat, you know. Yeah. And I think clouds always want to uh, shake that status quo, you know. Right. I right. wasn't this, you know, lovely, sweet child. I was a very challenging child. I wanted to know things. I wanted to turn the world upside down. I wanted to march in there, you know, and I asked all these questions. And now I've, I've tempered down a lot, right? But I think that's part of the clown is to be able to go in and turn something completely upside down and shake that status quo. And uh, one of my mentors, uh, basically, uh, his name is Michael Christensen, um, when this started as a movement of clowning as a profession that's quite a, a a detailed story which i won't go into but when he went into the hospital in 1986 87 somewhere in there you know he was dressed as a clown he was a circus clown at that point and a doctor said you know a hospital is no place for a clown <laughs> and he turned around and said and no a hospital is no place for a clown." yes and uh, michael said and a hospital is no place for a child, right? True. Yeah, <laughs> and in 1986, this started as a profession both in Canada and the United States, primarily at the same time, unbeknownst to the two people who started it as a profession. Hmm. And in Canada, it started with a lovely, lovely girl at that time, Karen Ridd, and this was her summer job. Hmm. And she was working with child life, and she looked around and her job when she wasn't at the hospital was she was a clown. She was a birthday party clown. And she looked around and she said, there ought to be clowns. 
And Renee, who was her supervisor, was a visionary and said, of course, there has to be clowns. So in fact, Canada started this before anyone else in the world. Ah. But then within that same year, Michael was doing it in the States. And then it started to evolve everywhere in the world. And we still need to, to work towards where it really needs to be. And so in India, we're working on that now. So it's a profession. Mm -hmm. And it is a recognized profession. It's seen as an essential service. And it is honored as such. Yeah. And it's based in science. You no, know? it it's is, not it just is. going on and putting on, you know, big hat and big clothes. Oh, and, no, no, you know, like, going like and doing it's, it's the most difficult thing to do. It's the most difficult act to be able to make people laugh. I still am a firm believer of that. Mm, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, yeah, I think in the in the US, uh, I think there is this AATH, right? That uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they, the they Association of, of Applied Therapeutic Humor. Yeah, they, I'm one of their grads. Oh, we oh, have oh, something. I, I, I oh, am. Okay. I am. Uh -huh. They're fantastic. Uh -huh. AATH also has a wonderful program called, and I'm a graduate, and I'm called a HAG. An H A G, a hag, okay? <laughs> and that means a humor academy uh, yeah. grad. Grad, grad, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so a humor academy graduate. Yeah, yeah I, I did go into the, the website and take a look at what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, not so much in India. I mean, I don't think it's in India, but somehow in the West, uh, and pardon me for asking this. Clowns of late seem to have got a creepy, uh, I don't know how this ever happened. A, a person who's evoked so much of laughter. Where did, the, where did this uh, world face uh, come about? How did it happen? Because, you know, people love Stephen King. Ah. And Stephen King did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to go, thank you, Mr. King. Thank you. Because in some ways, you've given us a beautiful, you've given us promotion in a different way. And so now we have to work against that. So I, I, I teach and one of the courses that I was doing, one of the girls said, oh, I, oh you know, I, I, I can't see a clown. I don't want to see a clown. I'm terrified of clowns. And we worked through that. And you know, when I clown, um, I'll, I'll give you our website. I just wear a small nose. My hair has these little things here and you know, a little bit of makeup and that's it, very little. And my clothes, well, I'll show you what I'm wearing after, um, are, are very simple, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think there's, um, there's not that creepiness there. Mm -hmm. That's there in, because of Stephen King, because of the, uh, the Joker. There's a number of films that now have that, you know, the killer, you know, it's the killer one. The killer clown is going to come and go, ah! And I'll sometimes go, oh my God, where's the clown? Where's the clown? I'm really scared of the clown. And I'll go, you're the clown. I said, I'm the clown? Me? But I, and then I'll take my dress up and I'll go like this and I'll hide and, really? You know, and I think when you do that, it shifts. Yeah, yeah. Right? It shifts. Yeah. And I think it's to honor the people <clears throat> that have that phobia. I worked with a nurse and, you know, when I was not in my outfit, she was fine. But as soon as I put my outfit on, it was like, and I finally sat down and I said, you know, hey, Nathan, what's happening here? And we had this conversation and I said, you know, here's the deal. When you come in, I'll gently turn away and I'll go to the other side. Mm -hmm. And in that way, there was a beautiful relationship that formed and she was able to, to come closer. But see, you also have to remember, why are people scared of clowns? Imagine when you're a two-year-old mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, we don't think of Santa Claus as a clown. We don't think, I mean, obviously we think of Ronald McDonald as a clown, but the Easter Bunny, but you're two years old and you know, you're this tall. Well, you're not, mm -hmm. but you know, for the camera, let's say you're this okay. tall. Yeah. And then you have this huge here's this mascot. And yeah. here's mom and dad and aunt and uncle saying, here, 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 go kiss, yeah. go kiss Santa, go kiss. And it's like, oh, you know, the child is terrified and we're pushing them in that way, pushing them. So I think what we need to do, and my colleagues are all beautiful at this, you know, it's, you know, if a child is scared and the parents say, no, 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 it's just a clown. They go, 
No, and it will sort of gently, gently. <laughs> and if the child is here, I'll just continually go and I'll make myself smaller and smaller. And then sometimes, you know, a child or even an adult will kind of go, they'll start to smile. And then I go, oh, oh, and I'll take two steps forward. But that might be too close. And then I go back, go forward and back. So it's this beautiful, beautiful dance. And it might take a few minutes. It might take a month. But each time the barrier breaks down and each time I do this anyway, and this is what I teach my Medi clowns is you come from the heart. And mm. that's why we don't plan something when we go in, mm. you go in and you know, you have your toolkit mm -hmm. and you have all sorts of things that you might come in. And this might be the day that the patient says, I don't want you to come today. I don't want anything today. I'm in a bad mood. Go away. And you kind of go, I hear you. I hear you. It's kind of a crappy day, huh? Oh, I hate crappy days. And then if they pick up on that, they might invite you in. Or if they say no, it is no. You leave. You leave. Yeah. Awesome. Ma, yeah. you worked with the uh, FIS for the project, I think, for drawing up the syllabus or something. You remember you and I were chatting about this? Um, yes, but that's a very uh, a different project mm -hmm. and uh, Piff and I, I, I have attended or participated in Piff's workshop. Okay. And yes, I do know uh, her course and what it takes and many aspects. In fact, my first question to Piff was, how do they allow you at all into a hospital? I mean, that's such a chaotic place. So many important things happening. A visitor is barely welcome. Family mm. and caregivers are barely welcome. Mm. How do they let you in? How do you get in? And it, it, is, it is an eye opener to me mm. to mm. listen to and watch when this training and workshops go on, Nanda. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how much of medical schooling is going on. Mm. It's, it's not about clowning or an act. Mm. It is about etiquette, mm. the soft skills of hospitals, what to do, what not to do. Mm. I mean, people could be in the midst of uh, resuscitation. A clown can't barge in there because he's been given permission to come. Mm. Mm. Like Piff was mentioning, and she will explain it far better than I, is you'll have to gauge the situation, ease yourself in. And uh, I've seen Piff and Hamish do it so beautifully. Mm. And uh, I've actually watched them in a hospital environment. We, we've uh, uh, been together at Savita, at Arvind, and uh, in a workshop at Metha's. Everywhere, what I've seen is uh, even the most cynical, skeptical person, they can withdraw a bit, but mm. eventually they ease themselves into the scene and they want to be part of it. I've mm. seen that happening. I've seen actually parents carrying their kids and going back a bit, almost trying to protect the child from the, any intruder kind of thing. But mm. then they come back. They mm. you know, kind of crowd around. I've seen that magic happening. And yes, uh, it's not just an art. There is a tremendous amount of science behind it. And that's the kind of the project that I was discussing with you, talking to you about. Because so mm. Fit was helping me understand the course mm. curriculum, what goes into it, mm. all of that, that we work together on, yes. Mm. And she runs huge workshops, different kinds of workshops. So it depends on the audience. It depends on the group that's gathered. So it's not one cookie cutter kind of syllabus. Mm. Am I right, Fifth? Yes, you are, Uma. And we just finished doing a six-month program um, uh -huh. where it incorporated a number of those things, which, in fact, you and I worked on together. You know, we worked on looking at the academics. We looked at working at the practical, uh, going and doing the field work. You know, what are the um, protocols? Why do hospitals need clowns? Why do clowns need hospitals? what is the role of a clown what is you know there's all of these ethical issues plus you got to be able to play right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need to know <laughs> the i can't let you forget community clowns fifth i can't let you forget community clowns remember acre yes 
community clowning is very, very important. And especially right now, when we're uh, in, in this uh, pandemic that we're in, we're not going out on the front line. Um, some of my colleagues in Canada are uh, in the hospital. They are considered an essential service. Um, we haven't achieved that here just yet, or I haven't trained my clowns in that aspect. Um, so we're a little more cautious right now. Uh, but in the community, absolutely. So as you may know, Nanda, um, seventy percent of the population is in the rural area, right. and thirty in urban. But the healthcare and the hospitals—it's the flip, right? It's the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we deal with things that are like hygiene? You know, clean mm. toilets, washing your hands, ensuring that when you cough or you sneeze, you know, you use your kerchief or you use your, you know your arm. And then what we do is we have puppets. Uh, I have a puppet. I don't know if you can see, but that's one of the puppets yeah. that I use way back there. That's Shanti. And Shanti does the puppet shows in the community. She doesn't go into the hospitals because of hygiene, uh -huh. but she can talk about hand hygiene. She can talk about, Nanda, what are those things that you have on your ears? Do you ever wash your ears out? <laughs> you know, you need to wash them out because otherwise, what are you ever, ever going to hear? But you don't want to put a pen in your ear. Go <laughs> you have to do it in a beautiful way. So in a community, we can start talking about community health issues. Okay. You know, because here, I, I have uh, one little puppet right here. I'll just grab my little puppet. This is Norchu. Norchu has actually been blessed by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and uh, Norchu was my puppet. Norchu was my puppet, puppet at the workshop. Ah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you and me, Uba, and all. Oh, Uba was the best. I love you, Uba. Hey, say hi to me. Uh, I don't know who he is, but I think you should say hi to him anyway. Uh, hello, good sir. <laughs> You. <laughs> he's kind of cute, isn't he? I know. He's like a really handsome dude. Whoa! Look oh. at him. Look at that beard. Whoa! I hope I have whiskers just like you. <laughs> and so when we use these in the community, it's absolutely wonderful because uh, especially people with disabilities, older people, children, we just say, you know what? Norchu needs to be taken care of. Can you mind him while I go and do whatever? Mm. And that gives them that sense of responsibility. Right. And we have a number of different puppets, right? Mm. They can also make their own puppets. So we do puppet workshops mm. where they can create their own puppet. They put the thoughts, mm. their thoughts, into the head of the puppet. What are their virtues, mm. you know? And the virtues of, I have love to share, I'm generous. I'm funny, I'm all these things, and I put it into the puppet's brain. Then mm. we bless the puppet. There's a whole ritual around it. We right. bless the puppet, we hold the puppet, we bring it close to us, we kiss the puppet, we look into the puppet's eyes. Mm -hmm. And that becomes their, almost like a talisman. Mm. And especially um, when children are sick, even adults. I worked with uh, widows and widowers, you know, from the age of 20, 21, but mm. they'd lost their partner, their loved one to, you know, in their 90s. And we created these puppets together. There was something like 70 people, it was a huge crowd, mm. that we created these puppets together. And that became their best friend because they were able to whisper. It's, it's a part of their soul that's there. Mm. Now, when someone is sick and when they're dying, they can't always tell everyone else what's going on. So this becomes something that is so special. We had a, we've done a number of workshops and in one workshop we had a girl who had gone through a, quite a horrific sexual uh, assault. Mm -hmm. And she was able on her own 
and I don't do therapy. As clowns, we do not do therapy. Right. We do not do counseling, right? right? But through the gift of the clown and uh, the, the, the puppet and what she created, she said that was something that really supported her healing. Mm. Yeah. I also did that with a, a young boy. Um, Hamish and I started a peace camp in Uganda, in Gulu, uh, where the Lord's Revolutionary Army had come in a horrible situation. Right, right. Um, and one boy had come, he'd been 14 when he, uh, eight years old, sorry, eight, when he'd been abducted from his village. I, I won't tell you the story, but it was just really one of the most horrific stories you can possibly imagine. Okay. And um, he witnessed, you know, his loved ones being killed in front of them, all of this. He escaped. Mm -hmm. And when we brought the puppets out, he lit up because he had this soulmate that he could speak to. Because, see, when you come back to the village, it's double jeopardy. You've been right. sent away, and now you've come back. Are you going to kill the rest of the kids in the village? Right. You know, 14-year-old boy. And this little puppet was someone that was close to him and he said at the end of it now i can leave my luggage behind a baggage he said baggage now i can leave my baggage behind uh -huh. and i can forgive my wrongdoers mm. and he was very genuine mm. very genuine mm. in that and i think that is the power of the puppet of the clown of creativity mm. of allowing the person to explore, not imposing, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, you've had this happen and that happen and this happen and you've got this disease and that disease. How do you protect yourself against two, two things? One is uh, uh, any possible cross infection. The second is, which I'm more concerned because uh, infections you can protect yourself against with, uh, you know, proper, appropriate uh, stuff. But what about the mental uh, thing, the mental thing that you face? The, uh, when you hear stories of uh, like what you just described, I'm sure you must be carrying a bit of that uh, back home. And it, it must be making a mark on your psyche. I, I want to address the first question, which I think is very important. And this is why training for clowns is very important. You need to understand the protocols. You need to understand how to wash your hands properly. You need to understand, you know, mask, you gown up, you glove up. Uh, you don't wear your costume into the hospital. You carry it in a protective bag. You make sure as soon as you leave, you put it back in that bag and you wash it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th and that's why I don't wear a wig because you know, you're not going to be washing your wig every day. I can wash right. my hair every day and all of this. So those are critical things. The other thing that it was um, a social worker that actually shared this with me because, you know, when I leave the hospital, I wash my hands. Of course I wash my hands. But she says, but do you psychically wash your hands? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me? Mm -hmm. And she says, do you psychically wash your hands? And I said, well, could you explain that? And she said, so when you walk, I'll, I'll put my hands up here, but obviously it would be at a sink. You know, I do my appropriate hand washing, you know, through the fingers, you know, all of this around the thumbs and, right. you know, tickling and whatnot. But then what I do is I imagine that everything that I've gone through, I bless it. I bless it and as it goes down, I give thanks for this opportunity to be of service and as it goes down, it goes down into the drain. And now because I live in Oroville and we deal more with wastewater systems, I know that it's going to water the plant. So it's not just waste yucky water. Right. The other thing that is critical is to come in in preparation. So when I'm going, uh, here I ride a motorcycle. So when I've got my motorbike and I'm going to Pim's Hospital, or if I'm taking a taxi to another hospital, um, in my mind and in my heart, you know, I have to generate that feeling of love. I do it in a few different ways. One, I have a mantra that I'll do is Om Mani Padme Hong. No, and I'll just say Om Mani Padme Hong, Om Mani Padme Hong, Om Mani Padme Hong in, in my mind. Uh, if my husband is there, we'll do that together. And then I have a few songs that I sing, and one is the Octopus's Garden, you know? And it oh, puts me the Beatles. Like, like from the Beatles, right? Yeah, it yeah. puts me in a really, really good sort of vibe, right? Yeah. And I, I laugh. So I have these things. And uh, 
when I work with my team, there's usually two of us or three of us that go in at the same time, usually two. What we do, what we do. is I do something called Nandri Bhumi. And uh -huh. Nandri Bhumi in Tamil uh -huh. means thank you, Mother Earth. So I go down and I um, bless Mother Earth and I pull that up into my body, into my heart, into my throat. I take it out and then I gather it. And I, oh, and I just go, mm, I love me. And so mm. this is part of the protection, right? So there's mm. an opening protection, an end protection. And I personally, I offer it up. I think it's very, very important to offer things, mm. right? To the mm. universe, to the divine. Yes. Now, the next part of your question is, yeah, there are things, you know, that I take home with me. Here I work in uh, the various different uh, units, uh, but when there is a sudden death, mm. that's the one that really affects me. Or if I've lost someone, that affects me, but then I know that it, they go, they're going into a different space. But mm. in my clown, I don't look in the future and I don't look in the past. Yeah. I have to see what's happening. Right. right here in the present moment. I'll tell you a small little story. Mm -hmm. um, there was an accident. <clears throat> and uh, in this accident, at the scene of the accident, there were uh, two women, sisters. There was three children, age four, five, and six. Uh, the two boys were five and six. The six-year-old was dead at the scene of the accident. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, five-year-old, was in critical condition. He had to be airlifted. The little girl had a number of bones broken. Mm -hmm. Serious, mm -hmm. but not life-threatening, right? Mm -hmm. So when they came in, the mother just grabbed me and mm -hmm. wouldn't let go of me, right? Mm -hmm. And we went in uh, to the, um, the trauma room where Sometimes I am invited into the trauma room. Sometimes they request me to come in, but I won't go on my own unless right. there's an invitation, right? right? And in this case, there's no way I would have gone in on my own, but this mother wouldn't let go of me. So I went in and then the, the young boy was moved into a PICU, pediatric intensive care unit. And so she just held me. And now this is where the doctor who was in charge at that time was not, a, did not like the clown, did not have any, just, no, okay. it wasn't the right thing. It wasn't the right thing. Okay. And this is what do I do? What do I do? And the doctor looked at me. I looked at the doctor. The mother obviously wanted me in there. And the doctor just went, you know? And so I went in and sat beside the mom. And this boy, the whole team was there trying to keep this boy comfortable. We knew that he was going to pass away that night. It was obvious to all of us <clears throat> the mother started to say her prayers mm -hmm. uh, it's not my job to be a spiritual counselor but as she's saying something i might parrot the words that she's saying so she was saying something in a language that i didn't understand but i just said the same thing and i breathed with her so i was holding she was holding me and i had my arm around her and we breathed together and then she turned to me and she said he's going to be okay isn't he and all i could say was I looked at him and I said, he's breathing, he's breathing. And she said, and that's the show that he loves to watch. And then I turned and I, I was going between the little boy, the mother and the show. The doctor was doing what they needed to do mm. and to prepare her. But my role as a clown is I have to see that spirit. Mm. That little boy lived for another four days. Mm. And in that four days, his family, he was a, a young um, Indian boy from the Punjab. Mm -hmm. His family was able to come in from India, from um, uh, Australia, from England, from wherever. They all came together. There was two sisters. And so it was both their sons mm. that died mm. in that accident. Wow. And so, yeah. That? And so that's how, you know, uh, Obviously, I'm not going to laugh at that point, but yeah. I journey. How did I take that home? You take it home, and my, my husband is fantastic. I have a team that I debrief with. I have a supervisor that we talk about these things with because it's important. I also do yoga. I also do pranayama, 
and um, I enjoy my food. <laughs> I enjoy having a nice meal, mm. and I I've been invited to children's and to people's funerals because they want the clown there mm. when they pass away. And it's it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever experienced. And I cannot go as myself. I have to, well, I mean, I am myself, but I have to go in my persona of the clown because they don't understand. Yeah. They, not that they don't understand. They don't know Fifth. Yeah, they know yeah. Papa D, which is my clown here in India, or they know Jampa, or they know Sasuma Cuddle. Yeah, it's the, the medical clown that needs to go. Yeah. Mm. The, the one thing that's very good to me is the suicides. The suicides, I, those ones, those are the only ones that really shake me up. The others, I can release, I can let go. The sudden deaths take me a while, mm. but uh, it's the suicides that are so, so painful, mm. really painful. Yeah. yeah, it is. And unfortunately, it's all part of life, I guess. Yeah. Nothing one can do about it. And um, I think also, you know, and then we have to support the family. So yeah, the clown yeah. not just there yeah. for the patient. Afterwards, you know, if uh, if someone has been coming to the hospital for dialysis for a number of years, whether it's an adult or whether it's a child, then all of a sudden, you know, not all of a sudden, but you know, they they pass away, they leave their body, hmm. then the family is not only left grieving that but they've lost their support of the hospital team, of the nephrology team, of wherever they're getting their, their dialysis. So we still need to maintain that, right? Mm. Because they want to talk about their loved one or they want to be able to now have a relationship with the clown. Mm. Right? Is that allowed, Fifth? Um, does the hospital permit you to cultivate these equations or relationships? beyond what you're called in for? Mm -hmm. There's different protocols in different hospitals. In Canada, what we did was, and again, each hospital has a different protocol. At the hospital that I was at, uh, we had uh, palliative care services. And so we would have the, ch the siblings come back to the hospital, right? So we would see them within that hospital environment, okay? and they could page us or they could phone us. We all carried pagers and they, we never gave them our personal phone numbers, but they had our office phone numbers. So they could reach out to us and we also had a separate email. So I had my clown name at da da da. No? So that was very important so they could reach out. Um, we had community clowns and this is what we were trying to do, not that we're trying, but we are doing here in India, is it's not only a hospital clown, but we then hand it over and we say, it's just like your doctor doesn't come to your house. The clown can't come to your house, but you can phone me and we can set up an appointment, right? And so we have, host, uh, we have community clowns then that will go and will visit them in their home and will link back to us and say, so-and-so is coming back to the hospital or you know what, they're not doing very well. And this is where technology is really fantastic when it works, right? We can see them, or at least we can phone them on the mobile. They can hear our voice. And that's like, whoa, Nanda, how are you doing? So I don't say, how are you doing? Nanda, it's so fantastic to hear your voice. Oh my gosh. Oh. And all of a sudden they forget their ailment. And we have a, a beautiful conversation or we start laughing, we start giggling and, you know. So yeah, Uma, and then here, uh, here at some hospitals, yes, we are allowed to go and see a patient at home. So it really depends on the hospital and the protocol of that hospital. Hmm. But tell me one thing, you have experience, maturity, all of that, and you are training youngsters. Do they know when not to overstep their boundaries? I mean, if they get carried away by their own, you know, people keep calling them back because they are good medic clowns. If they overstep and start counseling or start prescribing or you know something that they ought not to be doing, is that training also very, very strict and stringent? Yes, it is. Do they know where to stop, where to step back? We're very clear, and that's part of the training, is we're very clear on what is your role, what are your boundaries, what is your scope of practice? 
And that's why we're very clear as well, you know, as a doctor, as a nurse, you're not, yeah, you know, you might put on a foam nose and whatnot, but you're not going to have, you're not going to do the things that we do because then the roles get mixed up because the clown, you can just say to the clown, go away. I don't want to see you today. Or, you know, I didn't take my medication and I put it in my cheek. But you're not going to say that to your doctor because the doctor is going to make sure that you take your medication. The clown is going to cajole you into taking your medication. Right? So we are very clear on what is your scope of practice. Because sometimes, and this, sorry, I, I'm just having a non sequitur here. What you're doing is listening is so critical. You are not there to prescribe unless the prescription is laughter and fun, okay? Or let's just, mm, let's just, mm, you know? Those are your prescriptions and you can have a prescription pad. But anything that's out of that, no. You basically say, oh, I don't know. Let's go talk to the doctor. You know, but there is a tendency for people to say, because it makes them feel important, right? Oh, because when you go in as a clown, go figure. They, I, I, I don't understand this, but when I go into the clown, they'll ask me what their disease is, or they'll tell me all about their disease. And it's because they want someone to listen to them. Mm. And so we train our people to listen to them. And uh, someone asked me, about, they said, you know, I have to have a CAT scan and the CAT scan hasn't worked. This is the third time I'm coming back for a CAT scan. And I looked at them and I said, next time I come, I'm gonna bring the cat. Next time I came, I had a little stuffed camel. And I said, there were no cats, but I got a camel. And I, you know, scanned them up and down. And I said, this is why. And then I, you know, produce a little picture. And I said, this is what you have in your tummy. It's a camel. And that's why you have these bumps. You know, and something so ridiculous, right? It's so ridiculous that they laugh and I go to the doctor and I say, doctor, you know what? It is a camel that's in there. That's why they're in, you know, whatever. So you take it and you turn it upside down. And that's the beauty of it. True. But, but they could be stripping professionals off a certain amount of professional ego also. So how welcome is the clown with professionals. I'm sure there's no two doctors that are alike or equally welcoming. You would have resistance, you would have rece good reception. How does it work? There is some resistance, absolutely. And there are egos, absolutely. And the clown basically has to bow down. You know, as a clown, you're on the very bottom of the totem pole. If the doctor really doesn't want you there and the patient does, <laughs> you know, you have to weigh what is the important thing that's here? How important is it that I'm there? Uh, how do I negotiate that? But even before that, I really, really have to build a good relationship with the doctor. That is so important, not just with the doctor, but with the primary team, with the nurse. The nurses do a lot of stuff. The doctors, you know, come in and out, they're fantastic, but it's the nurse that's constantly doing the caregiving, right? So we need to build that relationship and go to them, make sure that they feel honored as well. Mm. That is critical. When um, a doctor buys in, then it's magical. It's absolutely magical yeah. because we each have that role that we play. And that role that we play is beautiful. Um, so for example, there was a, a little girl. Mm. And she had, uh, she would refuse to eat. She was not eating at all. That was it. And she was not complying with medication. Her organs were starting to, starting to shut down. She was on intravenous and it was, a, it was a very serious situation. So I came in and she had uh, uh, a number of stuffed animals, you know, around her bed. And I just took the stuffed animal. Um, let's say this is a stuffed animal. It was bigger than that. Anyway, this is a stuffed animal. And I went, uh, there was a nurse beside me. And I went, the nurse went up, the nurse, the sheep went up the hill, the sheep went up the hill, the sheep went up the hill, and went, <laughs> and, you know, toilet humor, right? And it went, <laughs> and the little girl just burst into reams of laughter. She just laughed and laughed and laughed. And I thought, oh, 
well, let's play this up a few more times. So then, you know, in came, you know, mother did that with the mom, did that with someone else. Uh, and then I saw the doctor going by and I said, oh, wait, wait, wait. And I called and I'd already had a very good relationship with this doctor. And I said, hey, can you come just play with me? Just trust me, just trust me. So we did that. And the little girl was like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And, you know, the sheep went up the hill, the sheep went up the hill, the sheep went up the hill. Went... <laughs> and the doctor went, oh! <laughs> and the little girl went, yay! And so what we did was we evened yeah. the playing field. Right. We leveled it off. And she started to take her meds again. And there was a different relationship between the doctor and the, um, the patient. Wow. So, I mean, that is the beauty, is yeah. to be able to, to work that. But you have to have that confidence that the doctor is a human being. Mm. They're not God. Mm. They are a yeah. human being. Yeah. And I think because Hamish and I both come from medical, ba uh, medical families, um, because we worked in the faculty of medicine and because, uh, and, the, and because we've done some training with the students and with foreign trained doctors, we see them as human beings. We don't put them on a pedestal. Mm. And I think that makes a huge, huge difference. Yeah. I afford them the respect mm. that is due to anyone. Like anyone. any other professional, that's it. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So some of the stats that I've watched, I, I mean, I, I read through on the AATH website was uh, humor cuts down stress by 39%, mm -hmm. uh, increases productivity twice the productivity, and 23% uh, improvement in memory recall. I mean, those are amazing. Uh, absolutely. And the science is now proving what we have known innately. Hmm? So for example, with the, the memory, we also do clowning and laughter in schools. It's mm. very, very important because we see how it de-stresses kids when they do their examinations and mm. also it supports them in getting better grades. Mm. We also work with people that have had strokes, right? Mm -hmm. Have strokes or have Alzheimer's and that improves their memory. It takes a little while, but they soon, you know, it, it, it's not just cognitive, it's taking the touch, it's taking the feeling, and we go shoulder, shoulder, we laugh, you know, we touch their, their eyebrows, we support that. So then it's that connection right. that comes back. Right. Very, very important. Yeah. And I, I don't know if that, it was on that study as well, but did you know that a few years ago they did a study and uh, the infertility rate, mm -hmm. uh, or the fertility rate increased by 16.9%. I don't know what their testing <laughs> methodology was. Yeah. But I mean, they agree. India could do with the less humor, I guess. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, right now, India can use up a lot of humor. But, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. We, we have to see it. And, and my friend, Sarah Ann, um, has comedy cures, you know, she right, was in right. stage four. You know, Sarah Ann was in stage four cancer and she just laughed herself. Mm. And uh, she's been on, oh gosh, Sarah Ann, where have you been on? She's been on Letterman, she's been on CNN, she's got a book out, mm. all sorts of stuff. <clears throat> and so we need to look at this because it's shifting that mindset, right? It is, it is, yeah. So it's shift that mindset. I think by law, they should have a clown, in, uh, a medic clown in every hospital, if you ask me. I think I, it's, I, it's about time. Not only am I going to ask you, I'm going to vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 I, I can't, can't remember. There's one country in the world where it's now mandated. It's, it's, I don't know if it's a law, but they're uh -huh. looking at there has to be clowns in hospitals. Yeah. And this is what we would love to have in India. Right. There right. needs to be that. Yeah. And so, you know, I ask you and I ask your viewers out there, what can you do to support this? Right. What can you do at a, you know, um, at every level possible, grassroots, political, high level? Mm. How can we have this? Mm. And you're talking about the stats right now and the scientific research that backs that up. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's hard data. It's not something cooked up. It's not it's not empirical. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's hard facts. So one of the projects that we have, which we're very very excited about, is called India Knows Love, and now it's shifting to the world knows love. We have 1.34 billion people living mm. in this beautiful motherland, right? Mm. And we have, I don't know how many Indians living abroad. <clears throat> and I was born in Tanzania. I grew up in Canada. My parents are from Bangalore, but I wanted to come back. I wanted to come back to, to the motherland. Mm. And when we were starting to explore clown noses, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's clown noses that are made in China, they're made in the United States, they're made out of all these different materials. But we thought, what can we do that is sustainable, that's eco-friendly, and where the whole world can come together? And we came up with this. This is called a nungu, okay? Yeah, it's a yeah. palmata seed, right? right? right. Palmata seed falls mm -hmm. from the tree, yeah. right? And then we have carpenters. So this is very important to us because we're also providing livelihoods. It's one mm -hmm. of the sustainable development goals. We're providing livelihoods um, for rural development, but we're also providing a livelihood for women to learn how to use different equipment and saws. So, and they can stay home. Older people can do this. The older people may not be able to, to, to cut this, but this is cut and then it looks like this. Okay, okay. okay. this is the outside. Uh -huh. This is the inside. Okay. Then it gets cleaned out and it gets polished. Uh-huh. Right? And so you've got that. And then you've got, excuse me one moment. You've got huh. so, I mean some of the simplest things make the greatest difference, really. They do. And you know what? I can do, well, not me, but Finn can do the most amazing workshop, the most amazing talk. But as soon as the nose comes out, the camera comes out, selfies, and that's it. Just give me a moment here. The selfies wow. come out. It's almost and... related to a different persona. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's awesome. what happens. Yeah. yeah. And that's what happens, right? Is it's the smallest mass in the world. Yeah. And we make these. And they're eco-friendly. They're 99, I don't know the exact percentage, but obviously the string is not um, um, eco-friendly. We're looking at having biodegradable string and the paint, we need to work on that. But the project is called mm -hmm. India Knows Love. And Uma has been just so wonderful in um, working with us and helping us to strategize about this. So oh, it, nose, nose, N O S E. Oh, duh. N O S E. Oh, yeah. Okay. Play on N the word nose, India okay. nose. Yeah. Okay, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you see in um, United States, they have Red Nose Day. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. They have Red Nose Day in Europe. Uh, they have this in Australia. But I think we need to have something different than just Red Nose Day. Yeah. We need to love. 1.3 billion people and we need to come together as a nation right. we need to come together as one heart mm. and that's what this is about it's coming together for me as one people wow. one people and um in the year 2022 on august the 15th it's india is celebrating her 75th anniversary of independence mm. so we would love everyone in India to be gifted. Well, everyone is 1.34 billion, but at least 75 million noses. So we would love to be able to gift people, uh, to sell them, to distribute them, whatever, right? To 75 million people. And uh, I live in Oroville. Oroville was the dream of uh, uh, mother and Sri Aurobindo. And Sri Aurobindo was a freedom fighter. He was the one that fought for India's independence. And in 1947, he also had five dreams. And he saw, uh, he, he saw India taking the lead. And so what we would like to do internationally mm. is to distribute 
150 million noses mm -hmm. because that would have been his 150th anniversary of his birth. And I think that's a beautiful way to bring everyone together. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, for me, it's when the most privileged person in the world can look at someone who's maybe not as privileged as them mm. and can hand them the nose and they can look into each other's eye and they can only see the divine spark and they can only see oneness, then I believe that we will heal the world and we will create beautiful human unity.